I've always said that I believed that Shattered Space wasn't going to save Starfield, but I was so cautiously optimistic that the DLC would show that Bethesda was taking a step in the right direction. Unfortunately, Shattered Space, instead of shattering expectations, more like shattered on expectations. Although there were some criticisms that I felt are unjustified. So without further ado, let's take a look at what went wrong in this Shattered Space review. Now obviously I'm going to go into spoilers, but I'll try to keep the story details light. But if you don't want to get spoiled, then you can skip to this timestamp. So it starts with you encountering an unknown star station called the Oracle, sending out a distress signal warning you not to board it. And being the ever cautious space explorer, you quickly disregard that warning and proceed to board the star station. Once inside, you'll find the place infested with these beings called Vortex Phantoms, which spawn from an experiment gone wrong. So you fight through the star station, restore power, and grab jump to the Kavnik system, which is the home of House Varun. From there, you land at Dazur City, and the first person you talk to after landing is a high counselor named Malibor. The first warning sign for me that this expansion wasn't all there is in my very first interaction when I eagerly chose to join House Varun with the Serpent's Embrace train, and Malibor was like, whoa easy there, we don't even know you. And then like a minute later, he was almost begging me to join House Varun. Like bro, I literally said I want to join when I first met you. Bethesda could have created an extra branch of dialogue where he could have said, now I know you said you wanted to join House Varun, but are you sure about this? Otherwise you can't help us. Or something like that. You know, give us the illusion that that dialogue choice actually mattered. But no, Bethesda opted for amnesia instead. It turns out, you're the only one who can listen to or speak to these phantoms, which makes you the chosen one. Because of course, Bethesda can't tell a story without making you special in some way. I guess unless it's Fallout. Now the second warning sign was about 5-10 to 10 minutes later. After you join House Varun, you have to walk the Serpent's Path, which is like an initiation for House Varun. It's mostly walking through a cave while listening to the Herald talk about the origins of House Varun for 5 minutes. During the Serpent's Path, you're given a couple of optional tasks like blowing out a candle or sacrificing a grove. I thought it was going to be like the UC Vanguard initiation where Tuala keeps track of what you do in the exhibit. Turns out nope, the Herald doesn't care at all. The only thing that mattered was which statues you want to place on the altars which determines your title. I chose Devotion and Strength, which gave me the title Harbinger. I don't understand what's the point of all of these tasks if it makes no difference. Actually there is a difference. If you do all the tasks, you temporarily get burns, because one of the tasks involves meditating in corrosive water. But it felt like Bethesda could have done more with this. After walking the Serpent's Path, you meet with the rest of the High Council. And because you're an outsider and the chosen one, they make you an errand boy and you have to solve all of their problems because they can't do it themselves. Once you've helped all the houses, the scientists will have the necessary materials to build a device that will disable the energy field and allow you to enter the citadel. Inside you encounter the speaker Anasco Varun, where he tells you you have to fight your way to the reactor located at the basement of the citadel. So before we continue, do your choices matter in the story? Well not really. For example, early on in the story, you have to get a vortex interlock from a dam. Now you had a choice of getting the second interlock, which would kill the remaining phantoms in the dam and unlock a shortcut out, but you would end up flooding a nearby seaweed farm beneath the dam, ruining the farmers. Or you can leave the hard way, sparing the farmers' livelihoods. The outcome of those choices have no effect on the story because you don't even need the second vortex interlock and it has no value whatsoever. The only difference is either you get some extra loot from the phantoms or you feel better about yourself for not wiping out these struggling farmers who are probably gonna go bankrupt anyways. Then there are other choices you can make in the main story as well, but some of them give obviously better outcomes like a new companion, or more money, or even both. Like why would I choose the other option? other than to see what happens. Which brings us back to the Citadel. Now the Scale Citadel mission is the final set piece mission of the main story and unlike the final mission in Starfield's main story, I don't think this one was rushed. It's a really well made area with all the grandeur and atmosphere of a massive cathedral and it was a bright spot to the dark, brutalistic, soviet, religious, fanatical theme in Dazra. It's a shame you can't revisit it after you've done the main story. You can skip all the fighting and dart straight to the reactor. But I'll admit, I didn't do that. Because I was playing on very hard difficulty, I had to fight my way through the entire citadel there and back 
and it was a massive pain in the ass. It felt like cover didn't matter, cause these phantoms could teleport behind you and shank your asshole, and I found it very annoying. In fact, I spent an entire day doing this one mission, and honestly, I was starting to hate it. They just kept spawning and spawning, and I couldn't run past them because they always hit so hard, and I was constantly stimming meds like a crack addict. But eventually, I made it to the reactor, and after replacing the damaged vortex interlock with the new one, Anasco Varun reveals that this experiment was done for the purpose of starting a second Serpent's Crusade with these vortex phantoms. And so you are presented a choice. Either launch the crusade, or shut down their life support pods. Sounds like a very significant choice, right? Since I had the Serpent's Embrace trade, and I want to roleplay as a true believer, I thought sure, why not launch the crusade? After making either choice, Varun Zealots will start storming the Citadel, and you have to meet Anasco at Pinnacle Park. Before you get there, you can find various lore tidbits about House Varun and its previous speakers, and Jinan himself, to flesh out the lore of this faction. Once there, Anasco reveals he has to cycle the gate again, killing all the Zealots inside the Citadel, and you as well. And you either reject that and attack Anasco, or submit. And roleplaying as a true believer, I chose to submit, and as I kneel down and get thrown into the void, a cutscene plays where the Vortex Phantoms unleash chaos throughout the settled systems, launching the second Serpent's Crusade, and you watch your constellation friends get disemboweled by these phantoms. <laughs> just kidding, this is a Bethesda game, you're not supposed to die. No, once you do that, it just reloads the last save and makes you make the choice again. So you have to attack Anasco, which also meant the previous choice I mentioned earlier was meaningless of course. The only difference is how Anasco reacts to you when you meet him at Pinnacle Park. And you better have brought lots of meds with you, because this is the most BS difficult part of the mission I've ever played. I had to disable 4 vortex interlocks by flipping a switch for each one and shooting them individually until they blow up while phantoms and zealots were shooting at me and at each other. And of course, it didn't help that these vortex phantoms and horrors can teleport on my ass. So after destroying the experiment, and in effect the citadel, and barely escaping with your life, you wake up in a house with the members of the high council by your bedside. From there, you have to decide which house of House Rune gets the speaker role. The worst option is to choose none of them, and be serious about it. Because then they'll brand you as a heretic, you'll no longer be welcomed to Dazro, and if you come back, you'll be shot on sight. Any unfinished side quest in Dazro will auto fail, you won't get a free house, and most importantly, Andresia will be very mad at you. Otherwise, there's literally no difference in which house you choose to lead House Varun. The only difference would be different dialogue from house elders, house members, and the citizens, but that's about it. Then there's the next decision about starting another Serpent's Crusade. Now, this also seems like a very significant decision. If you decide to start it, everyone in Constellation will be mad at you. Except Andresia, she's fine with it. Oh, you want to kill my new constellation friends by launching a Serpent's Crusade? Sure, go ahead. But they won't be mad enough to kick you out of constellation. So you have to go on an apology tour around constellation and say, I'm sorry to everyone you angered, and eventually they'll forgive you even though you've essentially condemned them to die by House Varun. And that's about it. There won't be any measurable increased Varun activity in the settled systems, either in space or on planet, so you're better off not starting it at all. Again, another seemingly significant decision that actually has no significance. This seemed like such a missed opportunity. You join House of Ruin, you launch a Serpent's Crusade, and nothing happens, except your friends get mad at you. There could have been a separate questline where you assist House of Ruin in launching a crusade, help them build a force, or you get approached by UC or Freestar to become a double agent. However, if that creates too many implications in the main game that Bethesda is not comfortable with, they could instead create a new mission board that will allow you to assist in the crusade in exchange for credits. It could be missions like disrupt supply lines, kill UC or Freestar ships, sabotage a factory or an outpost, etc. That would have been acceptable as well. Of course, the consequences of that is you rack up a massive bounty that you'll eventually have to pay off, but if that's a choice, so be it. But clearly, Bethesda doesn't want you to actually start a crusade or at least face the consequences of doing that. So instead they... I won't even say half-assed it, or even quarter-assed it. This is a no-ass effort, and I have two problems with the plot. First, if the Vortex Phantoms are nearly invulnerable as Anasco says they are, 
and he has an army of them, why couldn't he use them to defend the Citadel against the Zealots? I mean, there are phantoms already defending it, but they're clearly not the kind Anaska was talking about. Surely he could use some of them to defend the Citadel. I don't know, perhaps it may be too dangerous to spawn them near Dazra, or maybe he wants to use all of them for the Crusade, at the expense of the Citadel. But even if that's the case, couldn't they just teleport anywhere? Like, they could just join the Crusade after they're done with the Zealots. After all, Anasco has control over them. And secondly, how did House Varu not notice a horde of Varun Zealots storming the Citadel? Like, after I woke up, no one even mentioned it. Did they not have observers watching the Citadel? That seems like an odd omission. For the most part, despite my criticisms, the main story was okay, I guess. It wasn't special, it was fairly straightforward. I mentioned in previous videos I was hoping to see the Great Serpent, which unfortunately never happened. Although thinking about it now, maybe it's better that way. Most of the new characters you meet in the main story are either politicians or government employees, which makes them hardly likable. There were 8 missions in the main story, and for most people it lasted around 4-5 to five hours. Although I was playing on a much harder difficulty, so I'll tack on a couple extra hours on top of that. Now unlike some people, I don't mind the story being shorter. I think it's unreasonable to expect the main story of an expansion DLC to be as long as the story of the main game, so long as there's other things to do. There are a total of 11 side quests and one activity in the game. I haven't done them all yet, but I can imagine doing the main story plus all the side quests could easily more than double the number of hours to about 10 to 12 hours worth of content. One of the side quests involve Andresia, where you go find her family and visit them. It never happened. Wait, what? Well, at least since we're in the Varun homeworld, she'll open up more about her time in House Varun. I ain't saying nothing. Okay, well, she did technically say something. According to a comment on Reddit, she remarked that she grew up on that seaweed farm, which I either didn't notice or she hasn't said it to me yet. But the fact that she's not even remotely curious about what happened to her family, I don't know, that doesn't sit well with me. And then there's Andresia's quest. Full disclosure, I never actually did her companion quest because I didn't use her long enough to get it, and I don't have enough time to do it, so I can only go off what other people say about it. Obviously, there will be spoilers for a companion quest. If you don't want to know, you can skip to here. According to Reddit user NashD27, when doing her quest after starting the DLC, they added new dialogue options to account for that, but it would revert back to pre-DLC dialogue, and it wouldn't make sense. For example, she says none of the agents in her position know where Varun Kai is and how it would be impossible to find, despite the fact that we already know where it is. But I think Bethesda tried to rationalize that by meaning intentionally going to Varun Kai, because we technically got there by accident. And then there's the issue of her handler, the Kadik guy who argued that he's the only one who knows where Varun Kai is and he's the only one who can take her home, which is obviously not true anymore. She tells him we know where it is, and you even tell him that you joined House Rune, but he won't believe you, and he'll go back to pre-DLC dialogue and argue he's the only ticket home, and Andresia will become reluctant to kill him because she doesn't want to lose her home, despite the fact that you've already been there. And when you talk to the High Council about this, regardless of whether you kill him or not, they'll say she broke the rules, but he had it coming so we'll let it slide. But this won't happen until after you finish the main story. So it seems obvious that Bethesda tried to account for that scenario, but they half-assed it and came up with this mess. You know, I think it's kind of funny that Andresia knows House Varun culture and customs, but just stands there like Johnny Tightlips while I make a complete ass of myself in front of her people. Enough about the story though. Let's look at the rest of the expansion. Kavnik system comes with 8 new planets. They're technically moons, but they're functionally planets. Of course, the only one that matters is Varun Kai because of Dazro. And out of the entire planetary surface, really only this area here matters, as that's where all the content is located. To put that into context, if this was any other open world game, an expansion this size would be pretty awesome. But because this is Starfield with a universe as vast as it is, it feels kind of small. And this is the first Starfield map designed for vehicular travel, as there are clearly defined routes and roads to travel back and forth. But is there anything beyond Dazra? Is there anything worth exploring? Well, I traveled around the edge of the map and in different parts of the cabinet system and found no POIs. I found different variations of Varun camps, small hideouts, crashed ships, along with small research facilities, forward outposts, 
gas extraction sites, and refining stations, all of which I believe are brand new in the expansion. But there was a conspicuous lack of dungeons. I've landed in a couple spots and have not seen a single one. Something to the equivalent of an abandoned cryo lab or an abandoned weapon station. Now I didn't mention in an earlier video that there were too many dungeons in Starfield. Every landing area had like 1-3 to three loot dungeons and it made exploring too predictable. In this case though, and I may not have found it yet, but I've used a map marker cheat in 4 different landing areas and haven't seen anything different. So I don't know, maybe it's just extremely rare. And you'll occasionally find enemies to fight in these locations, but it's always either zealots or vortex phantoms and horrors. Bethesda did mention that there were pirates and spacers to fight, but they're only in select locations around Dazra and nowhere else. The only interesting thing would be that the NPCs in these generic POIs would occasionally give you radiant quests. But that's about it. And this only happens on Varun Kai. So you'll feel the repetition kicking in pretty quickly and after exploring about 2-3 to three landing areas, it's gonna get dull. Honestly, I don't know why there are 7 other planets in the Kavnik system. I thought they said there was only gonna be one. It felt like they were added in last minute. Here's what Bethesda should do. And I don't know if they're already doing it, but I doubt it. Create new generic POIs and release them in every update. That way it'd create a compelling reason to explore the settled systems. The only problem is that it's gonna cost a lot of money for not a lot of return. Which is why I don't think they're gonna do that. Then there's the weapons. First, let's look at the newest addition to Starfield, Vortex Grenades. You unlock the recipe to craft them when you talk to the scientists about prototype explosives after meeting with the High Council. There are five kinds of Vortex Grenades. There's Vortex Binding, Charged, Leer, Phasing, and Unstable. To craft them, you need Vortex Shards and Vortex Cysts. Shards can be looted from Phantoms and Horrors and cysts can only be looted from horrors. Vortex binding freezes enemies in place for a short period of time, but it doesn't stop them from shooting at you. Vortex charge is essentially like a regular grenade. Vortex lure spawns a vortex horror, and it's fairly powerful. The only problem is that it will also attack you, so trying to create an army of them could backfire pretty massively. But it's really good for sowing chaos from a distance and watch it kill enemies from afar before entering in yourself. Vortex phasing phases out targets for a short period of time, or at least it's supposed to. When I used it on an enemy, they didn't disappear, nor did I stop receiving damage from them. So it's useless, right? Well that's what I thought until I chucked it on myself and became invincible for about 5-10 to 10 seconds. So I think the phasing grenade is bugged, but not in the worst way. You can use it as a temporary god mode to get yourself out of a sticky situation, or give yourself an edge in combat situations. As long as there's no enemies near you when you use it, cause they'll be temporarily invincible as well. And Vortex Unstable is a random effect. Since it randomly chooses one of the four effects, I'm not going to consider it as a unique grenade, nor is it practical for anything, unless your save's coming. If I were to rank these grenades from least to most useful, I would go with Binding, Charged, Phasing, and lastly Lure. The only problem with these grenades is that there's no other way to acquire them other than crafting. The shards are easy enough to get as there are plenty of phantoms spawning around the citadel. But the vortex horrors spawn much less frequently. Like you might get 1 or 2 horror spawns for every 5 to 10 phantoms. And it doesn't help that there are 3 different kinds of vortex cysts, further diluting your ability to get the grenades you want. There is a story mission involving a cave that is full of vortex horrors. But once you complete that mission, the entrance to the cave gets blocked. So it's really impractical to farm cysts to craft these grenades, severely limiting its effectiveness. Which is a bummer. I was starting to enjoy using the lure grenades. But Bethesda also mentioned that this expansion was gonna be more focused on melee combat. So what they do? Well, they added a new sword called the Varun Skamaz. And... Uh, uh... Let me see here. Uh... Uh... Nope, that's it. Just one sword. I'm just gonna refer to some clips from an earlier video about melee combat. I count 4 knives, 3 swords, 1 axe, and 1 Varun melee weapon. And the most creative one they can make is this postmodern art piece? Like, where is the imagination? Warhammer has the chain sword, and Halo has the energy sword. Dead Island is more creative than this. Heck, even Bethesda's own Fallout 4 has better, more imaginative weapons than what we have in Starfield. Also, did Bethesda forget how to make two-handed weapons? Not to mention, the melee combat is just really bad. Like, first of all, why are there no finishers like in Skyrim or Fallout? 
Without them, melee combat just feels very bland. Like I don't care if I'm on the moon, I want to suplex someone. Like seriously, how the fuck did Bethesda implement vehicles before two-handed melee weapons? And it's not like it's not implemented in the game, they're just flat out not using it. Fallout 76 has them for Christ's sake. Or even dual wield weapons, which you could do in Skyrim. I would like to see what two-handed Varun weapons their cross-eyed weapon designers could make. But all we get is a sword, which is actually now the newest most powerful melee weapon in the game. And then there's the new enemy, the Redeem, which is a melee only mini boss but without the good loot. They look a lot more fearsome if they were charging at you with a big ass sledgehammer or something like that, instead of a sword. And because they're melee only and have dodgy pathfinding, they're pretty easy to kill. Just cheese them with hit and run tactics. There's the Vortex Phantoms which I've talked about, and also the Vortex Horrors as well, that can hurt you with its shout and teleport and spawn babies that throw shit at you. But other than that, that's about it. Bethesda has been known for their iconically ugly weapon designs, and this DLC is no different. We got 5 new weapons in Shattered Space, all of them laser weapons, presumably to counter the amount of ballistic weapons in the game, and make the laser weapon skill more attractive. We got a pistol, the quick strike, the penumbra which is a mini rocket launcher, a laser minigun called the Starstorm, a semi-auto rifle called the Starlash, which looks like a modified Equinox, and this abomination called the Long Fang. Now I know all the other weapons aren't exactly aesthetically pleasing as well, but whoever designed or conceived of the design of the Long Fang needs to be fired. Like I know the games industry has been going through some rough times, but the artists for this weapon should seriously reconsider their career in art if this is the best they can do. It is so bulky and blocky, it looked like it came from Minecraft. Aside from that, all these weapons are pretty standard basically. The most unique weapon would be the Penumbra, which shoots energy rockets and has its own kind of ammo. There are over 40 new apparel items and spacesuits, all Varun themed of course. There's not much to say other than most of them are pretty dark. There are some that's like a slightly brighter shade of grey, but again I guess that's the aesthetic they're going for, for a culture that has no individualism, and their whole worldview revolves around the Great Serpent. You also get a free house after finishing the main story, which, I mean a free house is a free house, but it ain't no dream home. It's very small, it's only two rooms, a bedroom and a living area, and it doesn't help that there's a big ass fire pit in the living area. Also, when you finish the main story, the game will tell you new Varun items are available for your outposts. Which, I mean the only new items I can tell that are from Shattered Space are these Varun Habs. I wish there was a way to know which items are new without having to buy two copies of Starfield. But I feel like this was also a missed opportunity, because looking at the new food items like the groat milk, groat pie, seaweed and egg porridge, heck even the groat chunks. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think these are the first food items that heal based on percentage instead of a fixed amount. Not to diminish the fact that these also have awesome buffs, which is a pretty big deal, especially if you're a higher level player. The fact that you can't become a seaweed or groat farmer at your outpost is such a missed opportunity. I want to make as much groat milk or groat pie as I want without having to buy them from the meat house or other vendors in Dazra. It'd make the Xeno sociology skill much more useful. By the way, that skill needs to be reworked. You can't even get groat meat from killing groats. Like, what the hell man? And again, this could have been another cool thing you can do in Shattered Space beyond missions. If Varric can become a groat farmer, why can't I? Honestly, at this point, did Bethesda even want to do anything interesting with this expansion? Like, was it too much work? Did they not have enough time? Did they even consider these ideas? Did it ever come up? Did they really all sit down in a meeting and agree to make this expansion only about the story and nothing else? Because if Bethesda was famous for anything, it was their storytelling. Allegedly. I guess we may never know. There's no new ship parts in this expansion, which is odd. Despite House Varun's complete isolation from the settled systems, they're still completely reliant on third party manufacturers for their ship components. It's like if North Korea relied on American components to build their nukes. But you can now buy Varun ships directly from the spaceport, instead of having to steal them from Zealots. Which isn't exactly new content. And I believe that's everything in this Shattered Space expansion. One positive thing I'll say is that I don't think I've ran into any serious bugs while playing it. I can't say the same for a lot of other players, but I don't know, maybe I got lucky. So is it worth $30? Well before I say so, let me disclose that this is my first ever Bethesda DLC. I've never played Far Harbor, or Dragonborn, or really any older Bethesda DLCs, so I can't compare Shattered Space with them. That being said, contrary to what I've said in this review, if you love Starfield, 
Well, this is more Starfield. And with around 10 to 12 hours worth of content, plus a bunch of other locations to explore, for $30, it's actually not a bad value proposition. So if you love Starfield and can't get enough of it, then sure, pick it up. Although I'd still recommend you wait for a discount. But otherwise, this expansion is purely a story expansion. There's no reason to go back to it once you're done. The only reason I can think of to go back to Vroom Kai, especially after New Game Plus, is for the Vortex Grenades. But other than that, what else is there? There's no new gameplay mechanics, there's no compelling content exclusive to the expansion. I was hoping Bethesda would use this expansion as an opportunity to show that they've listened to feedback and learned their lesson. But there's not enough evidence that showed that they did that. I mean, they did modify how they laid out Dazra, made all the content centralized to one area instead of spreading it out, and made it more vehicle friendly. But other than that, it's same old Bethesda. And why did they add 7 useless planets in the Kavnik system by the way? What was the point of that? The expansion was supposed to be one planet. And these 7 empty ones seem like last minute additions. The only reason I can think of is perhaps it's for the modders, as blank canvases. Which doesn't make a lot of sense because there's a thousand plus other blank canvases in the main game already. Why add 7 more? Other than that, the only defense I could give Bethesda is 9 months is not a lot of time to make drastic changes to something that's already in full production. Although after re-watching the Shattered Space Deep Dive, I understand it now. Everything they've shown in that video was in the game. But there was nothing much else beyond that. It seemed like they showed everything in that video. If there were new gameplay mechanics, they would show it. Or at least tease it. Like two-handed melee weapons. Or farming. Or an actual Serpent's Crusade. But most of it was just lore and story. Because that's all they had. In the next expansion, I'm gonna pay extra close attention to their deep dive trailer. If there is one. At this point, the next expansion's gotta be like, Phantom Liberty levels of good for Starfield to have a chance of redemption. Maybe even No Man's Sky. I see so many missed opportunities with Shattered Space that could have made the expansion better, but I guess Bethesda didn't see it. If you made it this far into the video, thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed the video, hit that like button, subscribe, and ring that bell. I don't know if it's a good or bad sign that Bethesda is still proud of their Shattered Space expansion. I mean, on the one hand, they worked hard on it, and they were very intent on the choices they made, but at the same time, is this how Starfield expansions are gonna be going forward? I hope not. And with Shattered Space's release signifies the beginning of year 2 of Starfield. And so far, as you can see, it's not off to a good start. What will year 2 bring to Starfield? Will they actually do something interesting? Or will they remain oblivious and half-ass everything they do? We will see. But the first year of Starfield had no shortage of drama and controversies. And if you want to recap on Starfield's wild first year, then I highly recommend you watch this video right here.